Great. Hi. This is Maya Nye. I'm the Executive Director of People Concerned About Chemical Safety, and we're here. Uh, we just went through introductions, but um, if we want to quickly just go around one more time and say our names and our affiliation, so you know who's on the so who's in the room here. So you don't have to speak that. I'm sorry, we shouldn't have done this one. <laughs> TD Lively, Melissa Cross, and Jimmy Jeanette with West Virginia Division of Homeland Security and Emergency Management. Uh, this is Walt Ivey. I'm with the uh, West Virginia Office of Environmental Health Services, which is part of the Bureau for Public Health. And can you hear okay there, guys? Yeah. I'm, <clears throat> excuse me. I'm Pam Nixon. I'm the citizen rep on the committee, um, retired from the West Virginia DEP. I'm Tony Turner. I'm with the Office of Environmental Health Services, West Virginia Bureau of Public Health. Eric Tissenbaum, I'm a disability advocate with the Appalachian Center for Independent Living and the training chair for the Kanawha Putnam Emergency Planning Committee. Good morning, I'm Terry Poland. I'm the Ombudsman with West Virginia Department of Environmental Protection. Great. So, uh, I want to thank you guys for joining us and just to point out that, you know, the reason why we invited you was to just present us with some information about the Ta Toxic Catastrophic Prevention Act that is going there in New Jersey. So, um, so Paul, I'll hand it over to you, so just go ahead and take it away and just let me know when you'd like me to advance the slides. Sure, okay. Um, well, first of all, thanks, thanks for having us uh, with you today. Um, if you have the presentation I have there, what, what it gives is just a broad overview of our time in New Jersey. So just to go over the, the history of our program and how and how we've been implementing it in New Jersey. And if you have any questions as you go along, you know, please feel free to ask at that point. Um, so on, on the second slide, uh, just the basis of our of our program, uh, which comes from our New Jersey TTPA statute, the Toxic Catastrophe Prevention Act. It's a prevention of catastrophic releases by trying to anticipate uh, how they would occur and to take whatever pre uh, precautionary measures. Um, so on, on to the next slide, just a, a history of our of the, of the, our regulations in the Act. Uh, the TCK Act was passed back in 1986, and that was following, uh, first of all, there was the accident, the Bhopal incident that occurred in 1984 in India. And in 1985, there were uh, a number of incidents that occurred in New Jersey, industrial incidents, that uh, drove our legislature to pass and, and adopt the act back, back at that time. Uh, following that, um, we adopted our initial regulations in June of 1988, which, which is when they uh, went into effect. And in New Jersey, our regulations have uh, a five-year sunset date, or at that time they did. So they were readopted in 1993 and then again in 1998. And at that point when we adopted them in 1998, in the, in the meantime, uh, the OSHA PSM um, rules had been adopted in 1992, and then the EPA 40 CFR Part 68, that Accidental Relief Prevention Rules, were adopted in 1996. So in 1998, in, in, in New Jersey, um, our administration made the decision at that point to incorporate by reference the EPA rules of 40 CFR 68 uh, with, with certain changes uh, where to, to make sure that we complied with everything that was in our, our original TCPA statute and then also in, in adopting those changes to make, in, in adopting the EPA rules to make sure that we were at least as, as stringent as, as the EPA rules. Um, then in, in 2003, we had another rule readoption where we incorporated reactive hazard substances, so substances that could undergo uh, an exothermic runaway reaction, which uh, could cause an ex like an explosion uh, that could have off-site impact. Uh, then in, in 2008, we incorporated another amendment in, into our rules where we adopted inherently safer technology review pr provisions. This was a, a, a new kind of study where facilities had to, had to do 
in, in the area of sacred technology review. And um, although it wasn't, it, I, I won't go too, too much into the details of that, uh, but the provisions of that is, are that facilities have to do the study. They're not required to, to implement them, but they, they, they're allowed to select whether or not uh, they are going to implement those, those recommendations that come from that study. And then our, our current rule amendments are, are in place since 2009. That was the last time we had a readoption with amendments. So that, that gives a, a very quick overview of our history. Um, the, the way our program does, does, has been implemented is that it's, fun, it's fee funded by, by the facilities that are regulated, which are currently there are about 92 facilities. And each year we have to adopt a, a fee schedule for the current fiscal year, which gets posted on our TCPA webpage, and then that's how we, we issue bills to the regulated facilities. And the fees are calculated based on the number of facilities, which determines a base fee for each of the 92 facilities. But then there are also portions of the fees that are, that are based on the number of processes at each facility, and also the, the inventory of the regulated substances at each facility. And the, the way that all that is calculated is, is part of our regulation on, on how we go about doing that. And I did make a, a photocopy of, uh, of the link that you suggested, so everybody has a copy of that in their packet that identifies what the fee structure is and how that um, plays out. Sorry, Paul, go ahead. That leads into the, the next slide, number four, uh, who is subject to the TCJ in New Jersey. that uh, contain, generate, or have the capability of releasing one of our extraordinarily hazardous substances. Those, those are the list of substances that, that, are, list that are included in our regulations. With toxic substances, flammable, and the reactive hazard substances that, that I mentioned before. to the next slide uh, our list of regulated substances that we call EHSs, Extraordinarily Hazardous Substances. Um, there, are, there are four parts in our rules. The first part is part B is the EPA toxic substances. Those are the ones that we it, it, that come from 40 CFR 68 that we incorporate by reference. Part D is the reactive hazard substances that are, that are New Jersey only. And then the final thing is, since, since we do incorporate the, the EPA substances by reference, there are some du duplications that occur between the EPA list and, and our TCPA list. So if that does happen, we go by the lower threshold that's, that's listed, the lower threshold quantity that, that would be provided for any of those substances. Jersey, that the Part A substances, the threshold quantities that we have listed there, they were established in, in our initial rules by uh, a method that we use by doing modeling for an average facility use, using an average population density and average fence line distance. And those were calculated to be the amount that would, would be estimated to have an, an off-site fatality occur for, for, those, for that particular substance. So that's, that's the list of the Part A threshold quantities. Uh, so that, that leads to our next slide. Okay, so the, program, the risk measure program levels that we have in New Jersey. Program 1, which is sort of like an exemption. Three, which is the, the full, complete, detailed risk management program, uh, prevention program. And in New Jersey, we all, all facilities are required to implement the program three. 
Paul, I, I think uh, I think you're cutting out a little bit. And did you mention something about part two? Yeah. Um, under the EPA regulations, there are three levels of program. There's a, a program one, which is sort of like an exemption. Facilities have to submit their RMP, but they don't have they don't have to comply with most of the prevention program elements. Then there's program two which is a, a kind of simplified set of prevention program requirements that facilities have to comply with. And that, under EPA, that's defined by the NAAX code. NAAX? AX, which is North American Industrial Classification System, I think. Okay, thank you. That, that's a simplified set of regulations. Then there's the, then there's the program three requirements which is a full, complete prevention program. And under EPA, the way that's defined, or the facilities that, that have to comply with that, is that there's a set, uh, a set a specified list of, of the NAAX code for the facility, or also if the facility would be required uh, subject to the OSHA process safety management rules. So for EPA, that's, that's, that's how it's defined as as who falls under program two or program three. But in New Jersey, all, all facilities, the, the, the full set of 92 facilities, have to comply with the program three uh, risk manager program requirements. So program one is your general duty clause, much like it is for the RFPs? No, no, that, that's different. Uh, well, for, well, let's see. For the general duty clause, we, in New Jersey, we do not implement that because that's, that's specified under our delegation that that's only allowed to be covered or to be implemented by, by the EPA. So the general, under the general duty clause, let's see, let me go back. For the program one facilities, those are facilities that do need, and this is going by how EPA treats it, those are facilities that, that would meet the EPA threshold quantity but based on their off-site consequence analysis, they don't have any off-site impact. So they have the regulated substance and they have the threat, they meet the threshold quantity, but their off-site consequence analysis shows that their worst case doesn't have any off-site impact. So under EPA, they're allowed to just submit the RMP, but then after that, they, they're not required to comply with much else. Under the general duty clause for, for EPA, that, that EPA could apply that to facilities that, that don't even have one of the regulated substances, or they may be below the threshold quantity of one of the regulated substances. But under EPA, they have, if it is a, say, a, gen, uh, a hazardous substance that isn't necessarily even, a, even one of the regulated substances, but it still is hazardous, the facility still has the general duty to comply with, with risk management program requirements. And I think the way EPA would implement that is if they did have an incident where there was some type of um, catastrophic occurrence, that EPA would then um, implement enforcement actions on, under the general duty clause. But even if there isn't an incident, all, all facilities handling any kind of uh, hazardous substance do have the general duty to to comply with with the EPA requirements. That, okay. But that that like I said, that's under the EPA um, jurisdiction. Thank you. Okay, so on, on to the next slide, uh, number number seven. Actually, the next two slides, number seven and eight. Those are the, the program three elements, and I'm, I'm not going to go through through all the details of the requirements of those. Most of those come come from the EPA uh, regulations and also OSHA PSM. Um, there are just two things that I do want to point out. On the first slide, on number seven, there's the one bullet for process hazard analysis with risk assessment. Process hazard analysis is a requirement under both. EPA and, and the OSHA process safety management. But the, the risk assessment portion is something that 
that's additional uh, under New Jersey under our New Jersey rules, and that uh, un under that um, we require the facility to take all of their release scenarios that are identified as part of the, the process hazard analysis, and they have to do detailed modeling for for each of those scenarios to determine both the likelihood and, and the consequence of those scenarios, and um, depending on if there are if they meet. Well, first of all, if, they do, if the scenario does have an off-site impact, and then if it meets the likelihood criteria that are specified in, their, in our rules, then that would require them to do risk re to, to evaluate and, and take risk reduction measures for those scenarios. Um, the other one that I want to talk about under slide eight, which I mentioned before, is the ISP review. And ISP is the acronym for Inherently Safer Technology, and that's something that's additional for New Jersey that's not included in, in either the EPA or the OSHA regulations. And that, that's the type of study where the facilities are supposed to go through and evaluate if there are ways to either eliminate or, or substitute their EHSs with some other substance to, to avoid the risk or if they could re reduce the amount that they're handling by, by minimizing, or if there are ways that they, they could simplify their process or moderate where, where they handle their, the process chemicals under, under less hazardous conditions. So that's, a, that's an additional study that facilities in New Jersey have to undergo. And like I said before, any recommendations that they come up with that they have to evaluate the feasibility and uh, make a determination if it would be feasible or not. But one provision in our regulation says is that they're, they're not required to implement those the measures. They're allowed to select if, to, to choose if they if they do that or if they are going to implement that and implement the measures. But um, but they do have to submit the reports to us and. Uh, you know, the, those reports could be available for, for public review. Uh, so that, that leads to the next slide, number nine. Under, under emergency response, we, we do incorporate the EPA requirements, but there are a couple of extra provisions there that, that are specific to New Jersey. One is that they, the facilities have to conduct an annual full-scale emergency re response exercise and they have to uh, prepare a written assessment of that exercise. <laughs> and um, there, they also, there's also an emergency notification system that they're required to implement. And that, that involves contacting the, the New Jersey, the DEP hotline, if there is an incident that, that, e that either has offsite impact or if it was an incident that results in either uh, in, in injuries or, or fatalities at the, at the site. And then finally, the last, the last item there shows that if the facilities are going to rely on outside responders to, to act as, as basically like the emergency response team for the facility, they have to provide documentation that, that they have a, a written agreement for that. Um, that that's summarizes the emergency response requirements. Uh, the next slide talks about the risk measure plan con content, which for us, it, it's very similar to the risk manager plan that's required to be submitted to EPA. There are a few additional um, information items that have to be submitted for the New Jersey RMP, but for the most part, the, the large majority is very, very similar to, to what's submitted to EPA. Paul, can, uh, can going you to the next slide, number 11. Paul, I'm sorry, can, on the last one, can you elaborate what, um, what specifically, what's more specific to the New Jersey than just the EPA RMP? Because a lot of what's on that slide looks like what is submitted to EPA. All right, okay, let's see. Two things. There's one. There's and, and these are these are things that are listed specifically in our TC. Uh, let's see. One is that they have to give a, a description of the area surrounding facility. The, the facility. 
The other is they have to give information regarding what type of insurance they, they cover. There, and, and in that, there, were, there aren't requirements what or how much insurance they have to cover, but whatever they do have, they, have, they just have to identify that. Another item where it lists the, 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 sub, the, the EHS substances that they, that they do handle, they have to specify how they handle it. And that's, that's identifying things like whether it's a raw material, if it's a byproduct, if it's an end product. Uh, and then there's one last, actually I don't have it in front of me right now. Let me, let me just look it up for a second. There's one last requirement. If you can just pardon me for one one moment. Sure. Last item is that the people that have developed the risk manager program to identify their titles and their expertise and, and affiliation. The large majority of the RMP, I would say 99% of it, it comes from the, the, the EPA requirements of, of the information that has to be provided. Thank you. Uh, that leads on to the next one. for updating the RMP, the risk management plan. 68190, that's, that's the EPA requirement. There are several occurrences there that would trigger a facility having to, to submit an RMP update, a complete update of their RMP. So that, I, I'm not going to go through all those right now. But then under New Jersey, there are a couple, a couple other uh, provisions that, that we've included where there are, if, if there is an inventory up, uh, increase, there's a, that, that's an additional requirement for submitting uh, a, a correction to us. And then under, under New Jersey, there's, uh, there's a provision in our rule for new covered processes. And there are, there are a couple things re related to that. Um, one is that that, that that is one of the additional items that would trigger an, an an RMP update, um, but there's also, well, actually, I'll, that, I'll get to that a little bit later. There's other requirements that, that facilities have to comply with new covered processes, so I'll, I'll get to that in a, a little bit later. Uh, leading, leading to our the next slide, number twelve. This is, this is another set of requirements that, that goes beyond what, what's under the EPA rule. Uh, for, our New Jersey, for our New Jersey facilities, all, all of the facilities are required to submit an annual report to us. And what that annual report is, it's pretty much like an executive summary, where it summarizes the, the facility's implementation of the risk manager program over the previous year. Part of, part of the item, part of the, the uh, part of that submission includes the, the compliance report, um, the, the compliance audit report, which in New Jersey all facilities are required to do that annually under the New Jersey and under the EPA and the, the OSHA PSM rule facility, the, the compliance audit is, is required every three years. So that's another area where we're stricter. And in the annual in, in the annual report that comes into us, there are also provisions like um, listing any, incident, any incidents or accidents that occurred over the year, or if there are any changes that occurred in the program to, to list those out. So it, overall, it, it pretty much gives like an executive summary, and, and we use that to identify you know, if basically if there are any major occurrences that, that have occurred at the facility. That, uh, that might, you know, warrant a, a closer look. 
Uh, so that leads to the next slide, number 13, on uh, new, new covered processes. Either a new facility or, or, a, new faci or a new covered process that, that is being planned at, at an, an existing facility. There are provisions under, under, under our regulations where they have to make a submission, submission for that. A new, a new facility that, that is not previously regulated by us, there are provisions in our rules where we would first of all add initial submission and do a, do a technical review to provide uh, approval for construction. And then subsequent to that, after construction is completed, where we would do a detailed audit and before the facility can, can start up, we would issue a document called a consent agreement that would give them the approval to start up the, the operation of that facility. For an existing registrant, a, a company that already has an, a, an approved risk manager program with us, uh, the requirements are a little bit uh, easier where we, they're not required to get the, the approval for construction, but they would re be required to get the approval for startup. So that, that leads to our next slide. Uh, in, our, in our TCPA program, the way that we've been implementing it for the 92 facilities is that our, our goal, and we're, we're pretty close to meeting that, is to perform an annual inspection at any facilities that do have offsite impact, and that for any any facilities that don't have any offsite impact, and this is from their worst case scenario, that we would do a, a triennial inspection. Uh, in general, the, the inspections are are unannounced. Although our, our our policy for the last few years with that has has been to give one a one week notice, and. Uh, it's our scheduled in advance. Uh, actually, in our in our next, let's see, under our regulations, and and also it is under the EPA regulations, we make a distinction between doing a, a compliance inspection and and an audit. Um, an inspection would be a full compl uh, in enforcement compliance evaluation where in any findings that we would get from as a result of that review, that inspection would be issued in, in, a, in a formal enforcement action document. And as, if we would go to do the, the review, the site visit, and identify that as an audit up front, um, in, any findings that we would do with that would would be issued in a, in a document, and it follows similar to what's under the EPA regulations. First of all, under a preliminary determination letter, and that would be submitted to the to the facility, and they could review it, and they 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 have a chance to comment on that, and that so that could go back and forth between the facility and the do, and the, the department for a little bit, but ultimately, when everything is a, is agreed upon. It would be executed in, in a document called a consent agreement, and that that document we would not issue uh, penalties, which would be which would be issued if, if under an enforcement action and, and if it was an inspection. But under the consent agreement, after it is executed, they're they're required to comply with all the the consent agreement, but there would not be penalties associated with it. So, Paul, that's sort of an attempt at compliance assistance, the, the auditing process, it sounds yes, like. That, that's correct. It's, okay. Well, I mean, if, if, it's, more, it's, uh, it's a more lenient way to, to get facilities into initial compliance. And typically, we would, we would do the audit, or, or we do the audit if it's a new facility coming in to the, to the program for the first time, <coughs> or if it's a... Um, we, we also do audits, say, for, for new, new covered processes at existing facilities. So it's trying to be a, a little bit more lenient when the facility is, is first starting, starting up uh, a, a, a new process. Thank you. 
So finally, on, on uh, that slide number 14, a facility which which we identify as a, as either chemical facility that has multiple processes. You know, there are, there are some facilities that we have that have, you know, three, four, five, up to maybe about approximately 10 processes. That normally may, may take about two to three weeks That actually brings up another point. Uh, chemical safety engineer, that's a, a, a position title that was created for in, in New Jersey DEP when the program was start, first starting out. And the intention of, of, of creating that title was that it would be, uh, well, first of all, it's required to be either uh, chemical or mechanical engineers, and it would be people that have a minimum of five years industrial experience or process safety experience. So if, if we're, you know, the attempt was that it would be experienced engineers that would be able to, to really uh, do a detailed evaluation of, of the process safety program at the facility. Uh, then also well, going back to our inspections, if it's a small facility, which usually would, would be like one process, that normally would take either one or two of our engineers approximately maybe two, two or three days to complete the inspection or, or audit. Okay, so that's uh, going to our next slide, number 15. That just gives an overview of, our, our, of how we conduct our inspections or audits. Office preparation, re reviewing the background of the facility, uh, reviewing the RMP. So basically, to, to get to get to a point where they're knowledgeable about the current status of the facility. Then, in, in when we go to to, to do the on-site inspection, we would have an, on, an opening meeting with the facility personnel. You know, going over the agenda and. Uh, giving them a description of what we're doing. Uh, then starting to go through the management system documentation and, uh, and starting to go through the audit of each system element. So in, in doing that, when we audit each element, you know, normally we do a detailed review and reading through of, of the procedures for each of the elements and then doing a detailed audit of, of the facility's implementation of that. So, you know, take, uh, take like a preventive uh, mechanical integrity, preventive maintenance. First, we would go through, to go through all the facilities procedures, mechanical, mechanical inspection procedures, preventive maintenance, uh, going through all the schedules that they have set up for, for performing their own inspections. And then following that, to go through a detailed inspection of all their records to make sure that they've, they've met all their inspection schedules of, say, for all, for all of their equipment and that they have all the documentation in place showing that they have completed all, all those inspections as, as the way they're specified in their program. Uh, then I have, so, so we go through each element of, of the risk manager program. So that's like maintenance, training, uh, SOPs, management of change, accident investigation, all, all of the elements that are Uh, then we also do a, a site inspection where we take a tour through the facility and and looking at the, the uh, condition of the equipment. Um, we also go to, go through the risk management plan in detail, making sure that everything that's in the plan is accurate and up to date. And then finally, we do have an exit summary where we go over uh, the the initial findings uh, with with the facility personnel. So. So that they're aware of everything that that we that we did find, and you know, su subsequent all the, the, the CSC comes back to the facility, which actually that leads I'm sorry that leads into the next slide, number 16. Uh, following the CSC's inspection, they come back to to our office, 
and start to write up all of their findings in detail. Or if it, say, for instance, if it wasn't an inspection, that all those findings would get written up in, in an enforcement action document. And that could actually take two paths for us. One is a ne negotiated enforcement action, and the other is a pro prescribed enforcement action. Uh, both of those would result in penalties, and and they would be issued as, as as a formal enforcement action document. The one difference is, under the negotiated enforcement action, we first contact the facility and and would attempt to to negotiate a settlement, um, and that, that includes all the corrective actions and, and the penalty amounts. Ultimately, and, and that is the, the way that we normally do it now as, as our normal procedure. However, if, if it turns out that we can't reach a settlement with, with the facility, we would, we would issue a prescribed enforcement action, which is a type of, of administrative order, and there would be a, civil administrative penalties included with that. So that's a, a quick summary of that. Uh, let's see, aud audit re re results uh, going to, to slide number 17. That I, I actually talked about that already. If, if, if we do, if it is an audit, um, it's a it's a, uh, let's see, the result of it would, would be that there wouldn't be penalties issued, but ultimately we would issue, uh, issue a document called a consent agreement that would, that would include the findings, the corrective actions that the facility has to complete, and if, if they would not complete those, those corrective actions, there could be, there could or, or normally would be enforcement action take, taken if, uh, subsequent to that, that when, when we do a follow-up inspection based on those corrective actions and, and the schedule that, 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 that they would be required to do. Uh, so on, on to our next slide, number 18, that just gives us a brief summary of our penalties. All, all, of, the penal, all, all of the requirements in our regulation are spelled out in a, in a penalty table that's included in our rules. and. There are penalty amounts that are specified for failure to comply with each of those. Increasing penalties that would be that would be issued. Uh, so on, on to the next slide, number nineteen. As they go into our database, and our database, there's a system where all, all of the information from that is viewable from our website through this uh, little system or application called Data Miner. And so that's, a, that would, that's then available for either facilities or the public to review the enforcement history of the facility. And that, that's not just for our TCK program, that's for our entire New Jersey DEP. Um, the, the rest of our enforcement programs, all the information is available there also. Uh, so the next slide, that, that's just a quick sum of really everything that I talked about here. Really, I have, that, that's really just a quick broad overview of, of our entire program. Have any other questions? Um, yeah, thank thank you very much, Paul. I feel like that was that was very helpful. Um, yeah, I would like to open it up to questions, and I would like to ask that we do use the microphone just to help him hear and to help capture the audio. So, does anybody have a question for Paul? Hey, Paul, this plan makes some citizen led. Uh, so, most of the chemicals that that. Uh, fall under your program are the toxic and hazardous chemicals and not those that or, or do 
have site-specific chemicals, like chemicals that would impact the water system, uh, that are not necessarily considered toxic or hazardous, but are not consumable. Right, I think. The way that, the way that we, the way that we cover it for our TCPA program is that there's, there's a list of, of what we call EHS as extraordinary hazardous substances that are, that are specified in our rules with the, with the threshold quantities for each of those. So those are ones that are adopted by New Jersey and also ones that we incorporate by reference from the EPA, 40 CFR 68. So we would, on, we would only regulate those substances. So if there are other substances, say like uh, sulfuric acid, which that is not a, one of our regulated substances, but it is a hazard, hazardous substance also. Or say petroleum project, products, like um, you know, gasoline or uh, fuel oil, or, which you know, they, 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 they have hazards also. They're not regulated by TCPA. But there, in New Jersey, there is another set of regulations called uh, DPCC, Discharge Prevention, Control, and Containment, uh, which, which, is, which is under the, the New Jersey Spill Prevention Act. And it's, it's, it's similar, similar requirements to the, to the uh, SPCC, the federal requirements. But, it, but it is a, there's a New Jersey-specific statute on that and New Jersey-specific regulations which that's totally separate from our TCPA regulations. Thank you. There are, there are specific requirements on, on plans that facilities have to submit for that and things like diking requirements, and, but that's a whole, whole other set of regulations. And, and also a set, under those regulations, there, there also are, is a list of, um, of specified substances that are included, a much, actually a much more, much longer list that's under our TCPA regulations, but but there is a list that, that's under those rules also. I actually have a follow-up to that. Did you go, go. So, <coughs> Paul, this this is my and I. Um, my follow-up is just so you know, even thinking about you're familiar with the spill that we had on January 9th, right? The Elk River chemical spill. It was um, it was a chemical that was not listed as hazardous under EPA, but it was listed as hazardous under OSHA. Um, so I guess, you know, just sort of as we move forward in this program, just thinking about, you know, so in your, in your EHS um, list, it sounds like you use what EPA has and you use flammable and reactive, but I'm just wondering if this would be, have been a chemical that would fall under your program, just to clarify. Yeah. What, what, which one was that, Maya? I mean, what, what is the chemical substance? <clears throat> the chemical was uh, 4-MCHM, methyl, hex, methyl cyclohexane methanol. Uh, it was actually, it's, um, it's regulated under um, the Toxic Substances Control Act. Yeah, no, that, that would not be regulated by us, but under our TCPA Act. I think it's, I, there, most likely, I'd say it, it probably would be covered under our DPCC regulations that I mentioned before. And uh, just, just very roughly under DPCC regulations, if, if it's on the, the list of substances, then I think that that probably is. And um, to be a major facility, I think you have to have either 20,000 20, 20, gallons of capacity, storage capacity of, of the substance. We had the capacity, but it wasn't a, ha a highly hazardous facility. Um, so, yeah. Okay. I, I actually would have to go back to see if, it, if, if that is specified under our CPCC. That would be helpful. Thank you. Maybe we can touch base on that later on. Bill Kresser's got a, call, or a question for you. Hi, this is Bill Kresser. Uh, you just talked about the New Jersey Discharge Prevention Control and Containment Act. How many years has that been uh, implemented? Okay, uh, I, I don't work directly in that program. I, could, I, I would have to get a roughly. Oh, it was. In, it was either. I think. It, I think it went. 
initial effects of the early 1990s, but I, I would have to get, okay. it's been quite a while now, I know that, but I would have to get back to you with the exact, exact timeline of that, you know, and when, when that came into effect. <laughs> that, that answer is, is close enough uh, for what I wanted. So, uh, no, I don't know. I don't want to know the exact year. I just want to know if it's a year or five years or ten years. You answered it. Yeah. Other questions? Hi, Paul. This is Terry Poland. Uh, if you were king of the forest, how would you change this? What would you like to see? Yeah, um, right. Yeah, right now I'm. I really I'm not able to, to go into into that. Um, one thing I can say uh, under EPA the EPA regulations, which I, I don't know if you are aware of, but they recently they I think it was issued July towards the end of July of this year. They issued a, a request for information where EPA is planning significant amendments to their rule to the 40 CFR 68 and um, their <coughs> which they, they publish this, this request for information under the as a notice in the Federal Register and if, if you read through that there's a, a number of significant issues that they're contemplating in revising their rules right now thank you other questions this year. I, I do have a, a few questions because we have, uh, we have a number of public health officials uh, in this room and I'm, I, you know one of the things that I'm curious about is so it sounds like this was really this this happened before EPA's risk management plan was put in place so you sort of were on the um, you know on the early side of that but you know one of the things that we're looking at is what sort of interaction maybe you would have with health agencies I mean it sounds like this is just purely um, a program that's under the Department of Environmental Protection. Do you have any sort of communication with the uh, Department of Homeland Security on this, with uh, Bureau for Public Health, um, other agencies, OSHA? Do you have any interaction? Yeah, well, we, yes, we do. Uh, well, for, first of all, with uh, EPA Region 2 and, and, the, and OSHA, the OSHA offices that are in New Jersey, um, there is a, a, a there is a communication and coordination that we have uh, with with those uh, with those agencies, um, and well, that that leads into a whole, a whole other issue. There's I don't know if you're familiar at all with the executive order from President Obama um, following the, the the West Texas incident which created this ECRM2 project, which we, we have been pretty heavily involved with that, with, with EPA Region 2. Uh, there's been a lot of activity going on with that. Um, let's see, Re regarding uh, Homeland Security, we do have some coordination with, uh, with our, our state. There's, a, there's an Office of Homeland Security for the state of New Jersey, with the federal, I don't, we, I don't think we do. Yeah, that the federal is is included quite as part of the ECRM two project. Um, so in that way, we do, but not not directly during our normal or pr prior to the ECRM two. So. And how about OSHA or Bureau for Public Health? Just in, in thinking about like the overlap of process safety management and yeah, well we, we do have we do have contact with them regarding okay. process safety management issues with with the federal OSHA the, o, the OSHA offices in New Jersey um, and like I, with the CCRM two they, they are also part of this and it, they, there are now like there are regularly scheduled meetings with with all the agencies that are all, that are involved. And there, there are there are also provisions or 
but uh, plans on starting to to try to, um, to facilitate some coordinated inspection. But all, all of that is just in its beginning stages right now. But in the past, we have had in, informal contact with them. But, 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 but like I said, it's primarily regarding TS, TSM. Are there other questions? Do you all have any questions, Spencer? Um, I, I do have a couple of other questions because I know that they're going to come up when we, uh, we, you know, so we're looking at this program and then next we're going to be looking at the Contra Costa County Industrial Safety Ordinance out in California. And I know one of the things in their annual report they provide is sort of an analysis of uh, the number of incidents that have reduced since it's been implemented, both in severity and just in number of incidents, and I'm just wondering if, if you have any sort of analysis of that <coughs> program, and also just curious to, you know, um, what the relationship has been as the, pro as the program was implemented, you know, um, sort of the upsides and the, and the downsides. Okay, let's see. First of all, regarding incidents, um, Remember, I, I mentioned the annual report that gets submitted to us each year? Right. Uh, one, one of the aspects of that is the facilities are required to provide a list of, their, of the incidents that occur. Now, in, in our regulations, we actually require the facilities to re report incidents, what we call it EEHS accident. And it, that's an accidental release of the EHS, no matter what what the quantity, so it could be a very small quantity. So, you know, and over, over time, let's see, so we are, we, we are able to evaluate the number of, of those accidents that are being reported, but there are a couple of things that you have to, to be aware of. That one is, and it kind of fluctuates over time, because a, a lot of these are either very small, releases or, or near misses. And so some of the issues involved with that is if, if, a, if facilities that are more diligent in, in reporting things, it, it could make them look like they're worse. Where actually they're actually they're not. They're doing a better job in, in being in you know, being more responsible in reporting all those very small releases. So and, and if you look at our data over time, it, it, you know, it goes up and down and because a lot of it is, it depends on, on how the facilities are reporting these very small releases. But, you know, one thing I can say that over time we have seen the number of larger releases that there has been a decrease. Uh, and, you know, thankfully we have, we have not had any major incidents in quite, quite a long time. Um, let's see, what was, what was the second part of your question then? Um, it, w it was more of a general one, but, but what you said just uh, sort of sparked me to, to wonder. Um, so it sounds like, you know, there may not be frequent reporting or, you know, reporting may not be happening as it, um, as it should, is, is kind of what I hear, you know. It depends on what is reported. So, is there any sort of checks and balances as far as what is monitored for um, by DEP there um, to be able to calculate what a release might be? Let's see. Well, first, when we do our audits or inspections, we are we are evaluating information there to try to make sure, or as best as we can, to try to verify that they are reporting all the releases that they're supposed to. Gotcha. But, you know, I do have to say that, some, that, that sometimes it's hard, if, if it is a very small release, that it, it, it could be hard to, in doing that investigation, to, to determine whether it has been reported. So um, we, we, we do the best that we can, but it, you know, if it is a really small release that did occur, it, it could, it might be hard to identify that, you know, if it has not been reported. Okay. Thank you. 
but but we do we we try you know we go, we're going through various records and interviewing people we, we do try to make sure that people are reporting what they're supposed to right I don't, I don't want to bombard with questions. I'm really interested if you all have any more. We can, we can kind of debrief on this without them on the phone if there are no further questions. Okay. Can I ask you one thing, Maya? Yeah, please. For our uh, own curiosity, if, can, can you give, give up the, excuse me, to give us a description of, of what the process of, of your group is doing now and you know where, where it's going or what, what you're looking to produce? Well, what we're doing right now is we are developing a roadmap for a chemical release prevention program. It was a recommendation that came from the United States Chemical Safety Board after we had an explosion at the 2008 Bayer Crop Science Facility. And um, so one of the things that we're doing is just trying to line out what what that would look like. Uh, part of the recommendation was to look at some of these other programs in the country and see how they play out and how we could, you know, amend them to, to fit our community. So that's really, we're in the process of just looking at, you know, what, what's out there, what works, and then what would work for us. And just so we're going to, we're going to come out with a report that just outlines, you know, this is, this is what it could look like for the Kanawha Valley. And that'll be available to to whomever, and then the, the, the Chemical Safety Board recommendation, um, I don't know if you want to mention, just that the Public Service, what is it, Public Water Service Supply Study Commission um, was just um, uh, mandated by the legislature. Uh, this commission was just mandated after the January 9th chemical spill to look at the Chemical Safety Board recommendations and uh, primarily the interest around that is how to prevent additional incidents to drinking water sources. But uh, because the recommendation by the Chemical Safety Board is much broader than just focusing on uh, contamination of drinking water, we're, we're meeting to sort of hash out sort of what the, the larger uh, picture of that might be. So hopefully that's a, a good enough synopsis. I don't know if anybody else wants to contribute. Are you just looking for the how? So the focus is the Kanawha Valley, but as we move through the roadmap and thinking about what would it look like, you know, is is there a need? Is what what would be helpful statewide? But the focus is on Kanawha Valley, and the uh, the commission that I just mentioned, they are looking at a, a statewide um, program. So. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Is there are there any last minute comments that you wanted to make, Paul? No, nothing else. Um, like I said, I mean, you can if, if you do have any other follow up questions, that you you can free to call me at any time um, or, or email. I think you know my information is is on the last slide of the presentation there. So. Yeah, and we've got it printed out for everybody on the team, so. Just want to really thank you for your time today and really thank you for the information you provided us. Thank you so much. All right, you're welcome. All right, great. Well, take care. Okay, bye bye. All right, bye bye. Um, you know, I thought we would just kind of do a debrief and, you know, were there program elements that really stood out to you? Uh, did you understand and <laughs> capture? I mean, it's, you know, I, I actually did because I, I, you know, I understand the risk management program. I know that not everybody does. So, um, but yeah, I'm just really curious to know anything that stood out to you um, that you, that sounded like something that would be helpful or that maybe wouldn't work here. So, just what are some general thoughts about about the program, anybody? Um, I was very impressed with the New Jersey Discharge Prevention Control Containment Act and. It's been in effect for years and years. And he said that probably would have covered the January spill. Right. And uh, that to me, there's something about that that we're missing in terms of being able to assess some risks of materials that are not real high on the risk level in the government's list 
but are serious for our area. Does it sound like something that actually would be helpful to this group to learn more about? A little bit more about what it is? I mean, it, it sounds like it has something to, to um, like, have some implications on water, too. And then, you know, it sounds like that could be something. So I'll see if I can get some more information on that to share with the group. Have you guys done an RMP, a one bar analysis? Have you guys done an RMP training, a uh, one bar training? Mm -hmm. I mean, a, I, I, I don't know. Well, might be a good. An RMP, <laughs> risk management program, EPA is risk management program. Uh, RMP 112R. Yeah, the 112R out of the 1990 Clean Air Act, there was a management plan, was a brother, sister, cousin, kiss and cousin, whatever, to uh, have for a circle of that kind of stuff. So, might be a good thing. He mentioned an executive order from the president. Uh, was it TCRM2 or DCRM2? The executive order that he was referring to that just recently came out was 13650 and it's on chemical facility safety and security <coughs> and they recently put out a request for information um, and I think they're you know they're just in the process of analyzing all of the comments for that so they're essentially it sounds like they're reassessing the risk management program and what could be done to strengthen it or would, would that it. have any impact on our goals I think that will be up to the That's what we do at the college. We don't necessarily have answers, but we have very good questions. <laughs> <laughs> questions are helpful. Uh, I think the lack of connection with other agencies is something that, that stood out to me. I mean, this is just definitely something that is New Jersey DEP. Um, you know, and it sounds like that's something that they're, they're trying to do in the, in the executive order. That's some of the um, considerations that are being done. So it might be, I don't know when the final date of that is, but I think it's going to be soon. I don't know. Do you know any more about that? You no, know, I've heard I've been reading about it, but I don't remember what the deadline. Right. But when you talk about the, the sort of lack of coordination between the agencies, even though the DEP works with other agencies, we don't actively coordinate when it comes to our pieces of legislation that, that, that we have or that they have. <laughs> I'm no longer there. <laughs> that they have. Um, That's all right. We still accept you. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's it. Unless we actively try to coordinate it, our, the legislation with West Virginia's legislation when it comes to regulatory legislation, it doesn't include other agencies either. I mean, we just know we have contacts within those agencies, and and we we talk back and forth, but we, it's not actually there to, for us to actively coordinate with them. Am I right? Yeah, the only thing that I can think that we do at least somewhat actively coordinate would be the asbestos program. Yeah. yeah. Other than that, and even that, I mean, it's different. It's, yeah, okay, everybody knows everybody, but would you agree? To the point, yeah. <coughs> oh, yeah, we do that. Yeah. So I think that's as, that's as close as we have to a model that I can think of. Well. Anybody else? I, I drew that out there just asking if that's almost like asking if that's something that would be helpful. Mm -hmm. So that's just sort of something, you know. 
does it sound like something that would be helpful? And and I mean, because it seems that there was you know there was this effort that was happening sort of in response like to the January 9th event, and that that it's something that could have been helpful. Well, I agree because you know. From our area, the balls rolled way down the hill, typically before anyone makes their first contact with any of us, you know, and, and sometimes the horse is already out the gate by that point. You need one more now to make it a perfect three. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm just curious, like from, from Homeland Security, perspective. Did, did it sound like there was anything that, um, through the inspection from the eyes, did any of that sound like it could be helpful for emergency response purposes? Anything specific that may not already be in place? You know, I mean, we coordinate with DEP, GHHR right. every day. Okay. So, so, so okay. there's not a lack of, co <laughs> there might be a lack of coordination in some programs, uh -huh. but from the emergency side, I mean, the, the, in all the integrated planning, the EP, all, all the state agencies are part of that. Okay. As well as, I mean, we, when you go back to January 9th, I mean, you, you had DEP and everybody else on seat at that thing early in the day. I think the bottom line is nobody recognized this chemical as a hazardous material. Right. And so by not, because you got mine, coal mines that are using it every day, people touching and handling it, and it's not been an issue, so nobody recognized it as a hazmat. And that's why it didn't escalate to the level it did until it got to the point where it was actually in the water system. So, uh, but, you know, from a coordination standpoint, all day long, we, we, had, we were talking to Kanawha County's emergency response, we were talking to the DEP. So, you know, everybody knew it was there, but nobody, uh, you know, the on-site folks didn't recognize it as a real hazmat that was going to be a real potential threat. Does that, so, so we, what we're thinking of is the preventative part, right? So how can we put things in place that are going to help in that instance? So I guess just thinking about, you know, if there is anything, you know, whether it's something that you've heard of this, but, you know, is there anything that would be helpful in that situation? Like knowing what the landscape is, I don't know if there's been any, in, any sort of analysis other than like zone of critical concern of, you know, what are the other potential threats like that? And is it just a threat because it was by the water? I don't, I don't know if there, anybody wants to respond. Yeah. Well, go ahead. No. To, to me, <laughs> thank you. To me, the um, the science of risk assessment mm -hmm. does that well enough. I think that is, you you don't take how hazardous substance is and decide on that basis. You multiply that hazard by the likelihood of coming in contact with it. And the product of those two then becomes a number that's high or low. Um, you know, and here was a very, very low substance on the hazardous side, but very high on the quantity that's sitting there upstream from the, from the um, intake. And so if you can then put those two together, there might appear then some other places where there's this uh, possibility of a very catastrophic issue Which that we, we wouldn't have guessed because the substance itself wasn't high on our list. Which it almost sounded to me like that's what New Jersey, that was one of the things that they were doing and that was a little bit different from the risk management plan. Was that extra component of risk sounded like it. and the likelihood. Pam, did you have something? Well, yeah, I was just just going to ask on my I know that on, on in the January 9th, everybody did come together, but it, of course there was this somehow this donut hole that was there. That yeah, nobody well, there, was, there was a bunch. Of, number one, you know, the quantity that was in play early on was not that large a quantity. It wasn't until sometime later that the actual quantity was that was released was actually determined. So, you know, you're dealing with a low hazard and the initial reports of low quantity. So, it, it, you know, I, I don't think anybody thought it would get to that point that it was going to be a major issue until the, you know, as the day evolved and the, the true facts came out that we weren't getting in, 
the accurate information from the facility that we thought we were. And of course, okay. you know, on the prevention, of, you know, we do exercises with all the agencies all the time as well. So you know, there's a lot of coordination mm -hmm. before things. Now, as far as actual, you know, going in and doing inspections and things like that, we, we're not involved in that piece because we're not a regulatory right. agency. So, right. so we're not involved with any of those types of things. Has there ever been an instance where it would have been, I mean, you know, I just think about, has there ever been an instance when you wanted to go in and do a, a, a drill and it hasn't been something that that facility has wanted? I can't imagine that that would be the case. No, we might. And, and that's the advantage of not being a regulatory agency right. is the facilities are more willing to work with and plan with us than they are somebody who can come in and find them. Right. And so that's why we've deliberately tried to stay away from the regulatory side. Right. Well, right. I just I think in this process, knowing that you are the one, you, your team, you know, are the one that responds to this incident, you know, I just think that, that the information that you have would be really helpful as far as, you know, very, some gaps that you saw that you feel like if we, you know, if there was a plan in place that these were specific things that could be thought about, you know, what could be. And, and having been through a number of other incidents too, you know, because there are there are some patterns like not knowing quantities and things like that. So you guys working so well with Dorsey's group and DEP. What about uh, uh, like a group completely different group? Could would it help you for additional resources for like the mounds the folks up in the Moundsville pen in that section? Is there are there other resources that could help you? or training opportunity uh, help you guys? You mean, Beyond just the people here in the group, are there other people that could bring in? Well, I mean, we've got, we deal with quite a few as far as training and exercise. Well, the National Guard has a fairly robust training unit out the tunnel that we, that we utilize. Uh, they do a lot of hazmat training, not only for West Virginia, but for agencies all over the country. Uh, yeah. And we train with it all the counties and there is we do interact with other people inside of DP as well other than yes. like Dorsey I'm well yeah I didn't I just Dorsey's group yeah right. I didn't mean just him uh, but I mean <laughs> it's not necessarily even specific. just Canal Valley yeah. specific I, uh, Mike Dorsey is very involved with a lot of exercises in the northern <coughs> panel around Beaver Valley Power Station the nuclear power plant in Shippingport Pennsylvania um, his group um, itself is involved in those and DEP does a lot of involved work with the rep program itself, radiological emergency preparedness program. We're made with uh, Office of Environmental Health Sciences and um, our office. We also coordinate with DEP on their spill uh, call center. Yeah. So we, we <coughs> coordinate with them and uh, DWWM on a regular basis every day. Environmental and I was thinking more of the specific regulatory program before, so yeah, absolutely. So yeah, not. Uh, if um, as, as somebody from the public, I, I know that I found like knowing, you know, navigating through. Generally, DEP would be the one to call to find out if you know if there was a release or how much, but. You know, it's that's it's something that um, you know. You never know what agency. It's always it's. I guess it's about you know what what has been impacted as a result as to what agency you would go to. Um, so and it sounds like in the New Jersey, it's like you know if the facilities meet these particular criteria, then then you would talk to the folks in this program, this specific program. I want to point out too in. Um, in each of the, the packets that I put uh, put a list of what would be considered the highly hazardous facilities. It also outlines um, the vulnerability zone and the, the um, worst case scenario sort of like populations that are affected. So one of the things that like New Jersey had I think 90 some facilities that it um, you know, that it oversees, and I think that this is something that could be helpful in consideration of what a highly hazardous facility is and the consideration of, um, 
you know, how many plants we would be looking at. And if you look at this list, the bulk is here in the valley. Um, Can I ask where you got the information for the list? Um, this information was compiled. This is a, a report that's out. It's called the Who's in Nature list, and it's, it's compiled from the risk management program. There's some water systems on here, and it's based on the chlorine amount. Yeah. Gas. Yeah. Okay. And a lot of the water systems now are not using chlorine gas, so that's not as accurate as you may think. Okay. And okay. um, they've gone to uh, the power to right. chlorinate their water, not using the gas. And and you know I, I can't I don't know what year as of this is current information. So it is I mean like I I noticed that they're in. <coughs> So it, it, they've actually deregistered from the risk management plan, I found out. So they are no longer considered a highly hazardous facility um, here in the Kanawha Valley. So um, I just thought that this is something that could be helpful in sort of determining what the scope of a program would look like, you know, and looking at the fact that some of the larger impact is here in the valley, that it's helpful. But what it does not cover is facilities like Freedom. Right, which is a storage facility. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a processing facility. Right. And that's one of the questions I meant to ask him. Process versus yeah. storage? Yeah. Well, even if it was a process facility, it wouldn't have been, it wouldn't have fallen under the risk management program because it wasn't a regulated substance. Right. Yeah, but even under the, their program, I was wondering if they looked at storage facilities because a lot of the ones that he was talking about were process uh, facilities. Mm -hmm. My understanding was the process facilities have very strict requirements for secondary containment. I go to the South Charleston area right. community advisory panel meetings and if mm -hmm. they have the tiniest little leak from the primary containment, it's a big deal. Even though their secondary containment is so good that you never see it outside the fence line. So that's what the process industries are doing. And right. uh, I didn't know till January 9th that the storage facilities somehow are not covered under that. And nobody's changed that yet. Well, you know, we had a conversation about secondary containment before, Bill. I think as in yeah. Senate Bill 373, Interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, it depends on how the one plays out. Yeah. Not entirely, but mostly, yeah. yeah. It's addressed the containment part, at least.